Welcome to Envision from the United Way of Greater Charlottesville and News Radio 98.9, 1070 AM WINA. Uh, big thanks to our sponsor, Carter Myers Automotive, as always. Um, we are here. I want to get right into it because this is this is going to be a good one. Um, I'm sitting here with Herb Dickerson. We've got Brian Page on the way, um, and he'll he'll join us in a second. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about Buck Squad and your work. And um, let's, you know, they don't need to hear from me anymore. Let's get right to it. So first of all, tell them a little bit about uh, who you are. Give us the brief, the brief story. Okay. And then we'll get into some okay. uh, some some more of the fun stuff. Well, my name is Herb Dixon. I'm the executive director of the Bus Squad. We were formulated last February, simply because in the end of 2020, mm. there were six murders that occurred in about a eight week span, and wasn't done, anything being done about it. So we met at Reverend Edwards Church, first mm-hmm. African American church over on First Street. He opened the doors for us, and the whole City base was in uproar. Right. So out of that group, I mean, all com- the mayor, community leaders, and all that, we got together and we formed this group called Brothers United to Cease the Killing, mm-hmm. with the Anthony Buck came mm-hmm. from. So what we do, we got um, we you know people were very emotional, so we started going out in the street and just trying to help people develop communication skills that were leading to a lot of these shootings. And the first three there, hmm. four of the murders occurred right there. Four. Four. Wow. Yeah, we have two women were murdered, you know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> but so, and we just got tired of it. You mm-hmm. know, and we didn't see the local police in doing anything about it. And to my knowledge, all the guys that did the shooting uh, haven't been arrested yet. And this is back in really? 2020, yeah. The, guy, wow. the last guy, Buck, who was a uh, neighbor at First Street. He mm. did a lot of stuff with kids, so that's why we picked Anthony based on his name. Got it, got it. Yeah, so, um, and what we do now, we do cameras in the neighborhood, get guys to talk to each other, because it's a lot of so-called gang members okay. in this town, you know, and uh, I don't know how really qualified they are to be gang members, right. but trying to convince <laughs> them they're not is a whole nother story, right. you know what I mean? sure. So we just talk and develop communication skills so we some of these issues they got they can talk about rather than mm. shoot it out mm-hmm. so you know because they listen to the gangster rap on the radio and the gang stuff that they talk about so their first option is shoot sure and the stigma that comes with that mm. then they make you high ranking in the games and all that kind of stuff like right. you have to pay you do yeah right but right, it's so right. ridiculous you know what i mean because have you ever seen a person shot and i've been shot before so and what bullets actually do huh Man, it would blow your mind. And yeah. for a mother or father to have to bury a kid, mm-hmm. you know, based on some nonsense like that, we had just, we had just got tired of it. Huh. And with our reputation in this town, people started listening because they know at one time we were a part of that same mm-hmm. problem. So now we want to be part of the solution. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the, you know, so so what do you, what is this group? Two questions. One, how big is the group? And then what do you guys sort of do on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis? Well, the group was formed, and all of the, believe it or not, all of the members are ex-offenders. Is it, and was that intentional, or is that just kind of how it happened? Well, we kind of handpicked okay. who we wanted, okay, because we knew what the reputation was in the street. Right. And some people, like I said, from First Street are better known than First Street. Some people may be from West Haven, better known than West I Haven. See. Some okay. people may be better known than Friendship Court. Mm-hmm. So we kind of like the pick of the litter. I see. Okay. That way, if they didn't know who I was, they knew who he was. Yeah. So we can get in and communicate. Yeah. I and that's kind of how we did it. We we basically were operating on emotion at first because you would know people friends I have doesn't got murdered. Yeah, right? that's right. So Brian, who is the assistant director, he had a guy put a gun in his face. Right. Wow. And I mean, we're threatening to blow his head out one yeah. night. So he said, man, we got to fall back. You know, we got to come up with a better solution. So we hired this guy from Chicago, oh, Kobe wow. Williams is his name. He do violence and eruptions all over the country. Uh-huh. And he came down and trained us for, we I think, it was five days, uh-huh. all day long. You know, because wow. you know he's from Chicago, so right. you can imagine the amount of violence it's a, they it's have. a different level, yeah. But what he told us was, you can't, I can't control the whole Chicago. Okay. But the neighborhood that we pick, mm. we stop the gun violence there, then we move on to another neighborhood. So I what see. you do, you, you develop relationships in these communities. Right. So now I can go to First Street, even though I didn't spend a lot of time there. My daughter did, because she got friends there. Right. 
So now we're developing certain individuals that know what's going on in the neighborhood, and we may get a call on the hotline and say, well, such and such out here arguing, y'all probably need to get down here. Yeah. But what we do, we we canvas probably like three or four days a week okay. anyway for a couple of hours so the kids can come out. I but see. back during COVID, you know, a lot of kids, you know, they were doing the homeschooling, but they couldn't come outside because sure. of the gun violence. Wow. So that's primarily why we do the cameras and stuff now, so the kids can come out. Yeah. And why the kids can come out, we make them reach some of these kids and show them a better way. Yeah. So that's what we've been doing since last February. Yeah. How much of the work, anecdotally, would you say is is preventative, and how much of it is like you said? So there's there's a there's a way for people to reach you guys right. when something's happening. Right. Um. And there's that aspect of it how much of it is is preventative are there parts of it where you're like because i mean i think that we had this i I ask this question a lot of like there's the issue of things happening now right right? is there also a part of your organization that's like can we also sort of look at the the systems level stuff that is causing all of this or is it really just focus on like we just got too much stuff that's happening that we got to get stopped well you you think about the cause of it all and the cause have always been racism Mm. Economics mm. and stuff like that, because people gonna eat, right? Yeah, you know, no matter what it takes, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? And then, like I said, uh, the stigma that comes with that, right. you know, we function better as a group than we do by ourselves, right? So that's what creates mm. these gains, right? Mm-hmm. And and depending on how you were raised, let's say we got situations where the mother and the father are using drugs right. and drinking. So that's a learned behavior that the kid is picking up sure. at an early age. Right. So on the outside, it may look like the parents having a good time, but they don't see the suffering right. of what the parents may be going through while they're using the drugs in the first place because the socially using has been over. Right. You know, okay. I use drugs myself about 35 years, mm. you know, but I'm medicating something that I really don't want to deal with. Mm. You know what I mean? That's why they said people do drugs not to deal with reality. Right, right, But right. then you create another reality because uh-huh. here comes the law. Right. And you start going yep. to penitentiary. Right. And that create a whole new problem. Yeah. So we just try to prevent some of these children from going down that path. Yeah. You know what I mean? And once we do that or dealing with the kids, the parents will see, and they kind of pick up parenting skills. uh uh-huh. And talk to me about, and I, and I asked you this, but I, I want to talk more about it. How, how, what is the the sort of the bottom age? Like how young when you're talking about kids, right? When you say this is where we really need to start influencing kids, what ages are you talking about? Well, if you think about all the trouble that they having at these middle schools, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Especially around South and Alma County, I would say anywhere from ten to twelve. So young. So you, if you think about it. The, the video game, the PS5, now see, that's a new babysitter now. Huh. <laughs> that's, that's true. You know what I mean? So I can yeah. give you this game, and yeah. you can sit there and just play for hours while the parents are doing whatever they're mm. doing. You know what I mean? Mm. So if I'm looking at what's the game where they hit all the shooting, it's a real popular game. Call of Duty? What's, or, what? or Grand Theft Auto might be. Grand Theft Auto. About. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. You know how long that's been out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. basically, if you're sitting there and you're just playing this game, and you're doing target practice and all the stuff they do, you basically teaching yourself how to kill somebody. Do you think that translates to, to real violence? You damn right. Really? You damn right. And so you I think, think the kids can, can come from behind a screen like that and re, and translate that to real, okay, real stuff in the street? Okay, you take that, but then you go on social media uh-huh. where you're seeing this happen mm. in real life. Mm. So, yeah, I think so. Mm. Personally, I do, yeah. I mean, you may get some arguments about it, but sure. With our, let's say the mass shooting. Yeah. What are these games showing you? Huh. Mass shootings, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. And the guns they use. What kind of guns they use? Yeah. They use AK-47 too. Sure. So quite naturally, you are training yourself. You're playing this game all day, damn near every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you already done picked up the ski. All you need is a gun. Yeah. And target. Mm. And if you got any mental condition... This may sure. seem like the right thing to do because mm-hmm. there's a lot of mental health issues going on with these folks. Mm-hmm. You know, you coming up, it's from segregation right. to integration. But then once we integrated, right. we black people segregated from right. each other. <laughs> That's right. If you yeah. think about it. True. You know, light skin wouldn't mess with dark skin. Dark skin was the worst of the worst. Yep. You know, and sure. people develop this stigma in their mind. I ain't worth a damn. Mm. So what else I'm going to do? Yeah. I'm going to the street. 
And huh. that's what a lot of folks did and a lot of folks do now. Yeah. Who are, who do you guys partner with locally? Or do you partner with any, any other organizations, be it city, county, or other private? Well, you asked me the question about the local public. See, our main objective is to get information so we can solve some of these potential shooting rights. Yeah. So if I dealt with the police, yeah, the people not gonna give me the information because they gonna, I'm gonna be so called snitched. So these people huh. not gonna they not gonna say well now nah, we gonna tell him no because he gonna call the police, and we get more calls man we get called for domestic violence we get called for rape, we get called for potential shooting. What people would normally call the police. So they're calling you guys instead of calling the police. Instead of calling the police. I mean, we got like four ceasefires going on right this very second. It's been going on about four months because we talked to gang members that want to in the same game. And I never understood that concept, but they're in the <laughs> same game. What? They got arguments with each other because everybody wants power. Stigma. What? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, man, so it's deep. <laughs> <laughs> you might can't understand, but I understand because I've been there, done that. You yeah. Know well, I mean? and so that's, and, and I don't want to ask you about that, but I, I'm I'm really curious about sort of the interaction or lack of interaction with law enforcement, and I, I understand the the cultural lack of interaction with right. law enforcement, right? And we're seeing that play out on a grand scale, where right. where right. the law enforcement are are e- almost equally dangerous to people that look like me and you. And we can have a conversation That's about right. that later. That's right. But what what I'm really interested in is that is is why people are calling you you guys when they and is it really that? Is it just like you guys exist in a world that's like not necessarily as punitive, right? Like you're not going to come and like haul them off to, you're coming to try and solve a problem. You're not coming to take them to prison or to, or to sort of adjudicate them in that way. I mean, do you really think that's what it is? It's, it's, it's it's just a different, a different approach. It's all about communication, right? And we show them, I mean, if you look at my rap sheet and I have rap sheet printed, to show you my history and where it led me to. It's on the grace of God. I'm sitting here with you now. You know what I mean? You're right. So if you choose this path, this is pretty much where you went, especially these days. Because uh, murder, like this, it was a twenty-year-old girl got killed in New York last night. Guy just walked up to her and shot her in the head with a two-month-old baby in a baby car. You heard about that? This no, is happened last didn't. night. No. So murder is almost like normal, mm. Mm. and it's sad, man. But just imagine the mentality. Sure. I don't even think they arrested the guy yet. I don't think they found him. So who is he going to shoot next? Yeah. So now the whole New York is in the scale. Huh. But see, if somebody got to talk to him, we don't know how he was raised. We don't know his mental capacity or nothing like that. Just right. like the guy in Uvalde, Texas. Mm-hmm. How in the hell do you say a two AK-47 to a guy 18 years old when he came by looking in the state? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's a sad state that we're living in right now. Yeah. It's the most dangerous time really to be living. But you asked me the question who we partner with. We partner with Moms Demand Action. Yeah. The group that's fighting the NRA about getting to change the gun law that they sure. recently changed, but like I try to tell them, what about the gun that's already on the street? Ah, uh, okay, sure. Because even black folks, then we don't have to worry about no background check. Yeah. We buy guns in the alleys, right? And all yeah, our that's, trunk. Right. You see that's right. I mean? That's right. We're not so going we through the front door. Yeah, that, right. No, because they're not gonna sell us nothing. Because right. most of us are convicted felons anyway, uh, especially in the state. I just got my gun right back and carried a gun all the way up until I got the rights back. But now I got the rights, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really need a gun. Right. Because I'm not going to put myself in a situation, you know, unless I drive by or something like that could sure. occur. That could carry me anyway, though. Right. But, um, man, we're in a sad state. Man. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, if, if, if you if you wouldn't mind, it, just about, you know, because we, we spoke about this and we spoke to Robert Gray about this and sort of this approach that you guys have, which is similar to theirs, about, you know, people who understand, understand the mentality, understand the lifestyle, have a history either with the criminal justice system or with, you know, running in the streets and things like that. Is that really, can you talk a little bit about sort of what, how you turn the corner? I mean, like what happened, right? And sort of like, when did you come to a point where you're like, yo, this isn't it. Like this, you know, I can't well, sustain this or, or this isn't for me. Like I said, with me and Martez Tober, we were in this program in a local jail called the Therapeutic Community. Mm-hmm. And it addressed behavior modification. You know, it addressed, why did I choose this lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, I got two sisters and three brothers, all of them are college graduates. Wow. Yeah. But I didn't like school. You're right. So what's the alternative to not liking school? Yeah. Street, right? Sure. 
that was more attractive to me at a young age. I was a basketball player. Yeah. Pretty good. So, and most of the guys that were in the street were sure. basketball players. Sure. You know, so I, that attracted me. So, and then once I got to selling drugs, because I needed attention. Huh. See, I'm living in the household with two sisters, three brothers, a cousin. Right. Mother, grandmother, grandfather. Uh -huh. So I'm like the least one to get the most attention right. now. So I go out and get my own attention. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And that just was attracted to me. The yeah. movie Superfly, the Mac, and all that stuff. Yeah, that was appealing sure. to me at a young age. Sure. That like the games we were talking about kids play now. Right. Same circumstance. Interesting. So once I started selling them, getting all this attention, you get the girls, you get the cars, <laughs> you get the clothes. It's the yeah, same old right. thing. This was 40 years ago. Yeah, 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 sure. So. I just it just attracted me, but after keep going back, you know, because every time I was even going to penitentiary, like I said, I got shot. So I'm saying to myself, "Well, damn, Good. this this is not gonna change." Yeah. Until I do something to change it, so I had to start looking internally at yeah. myself and why I'm making these crazy decisions, right? Yeah. And it ain't because I suffered no mental illness. I'm finna school myself. I just huh. didn't want to go to college. I right. wanted the easy way. Right, right, right. And that's what I chose. And were there people around you? I mean, was it was it really you being introspective? Do you have people who you can who you remember like someone you know hit me in the head or someone helped me or were you just kind of like enough? Well, I had to look at myself. Yeah, that's hard I mean, to do. We, that's hard to do do yourself though. You got. I don't know. I'm gonna tell you how they did it. They would put a mural, just a regular mural. Okay. And you sit about this close to the mirror like I am to the mic, and you just look at yourself. You would not believe all the thoughts. Really? About your past that would come to you. You break down. We had guys break down and run out the mirror. Some would kick the mirror because yeah. it was just so traumatic. Yeah. So I had to look at all the behavior. I'm not looking at the drug use. Of course, I already know the drug use. I addicted to heroin, right? right. So the stuff it caused me to do. Mm. That's what led me to pay attention. I could shoot dope all day long. Right, right. But until I go rob somebody yeah. or selling drugs on the street, that's when the authorities got involved. So they uh, would lock me up. Right. And that happened like four times. Right. We were importing heroin from California. This part before you was born. Yeah. So that led to the interstate, which is by the uh, feds. Yep. That's how the feds got involved. Yep. So, and then as stupid as it may sound, the stigma Back then, if you went to penitentiary, yeah, you was a big guy. Yeah, more club coming out, right? Uh, yeah, you had more club. Well, club. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah, if you could survive that, yeah, then you was the man. Huh. And if we were just taught, yeah. man, you gotta go to jail. You gotta go to jail to be somebody. Wow. Now, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> Ain't that the stupidest shit you ever? Wow, man. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of guys did that. It's yeah. but it's generations of that. Like that's not that's not on one right now. that's not one example. That right. is. More common. I'm sure Martez and everybody else you interview would tell yeah. you the same thing. Yeah. 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 And it's nationwide. It ain't just happening in Charlotte. Sure. It's just all over the place. Yeah. Right? But these people that run these companies that make the movies and stuff, see, all this stuff has subliminal messages in it. Huh. And you got to read the subliminal message. Yeah. It looked good on the screen. Like I was caught up in the Superfly or the Mac and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But the underlying the stuff, mm. they don't teach you. So right. if you don't see it, you will never know it till it hits you. But yeah. when it hits you, it's too late. Yeah. So so talk a little bit about, you know, the the work that, that y'all are doing. And, um, you know, I mean, how <laughs> we got Brian, Brian's joined us. Brian's joined us in, in the studio. I think this is our first, like, walk walk in into the show. Hey, how you doing? What's up, brother? Pull that, just pull that mic to you. We, got, we, we only got about five minutes left. We got a hot butt. We've been talking to we've been we've been talking to her. We got Brian with us. Thanks for joining us. He gave us a little bit of background. Introduce yourself to the people. Talk a little bit about uh, about what you're doing. Yeah, my name is Brian Page. I'm an assistant executive director of the Bus Watch. And uh, we came into this. I don't know where he left off at, but we came into this after the murder. I got a, a, a phone call from a friend. Mm. And he was basically just tired and fed up of the murders. Yeah. And we decided to do something about it. So we started having meetings once a week in a church. This was before we have had any idea what we were going to do. Yeah. But we came up with this conclusion, how we was going to approach it. And the city uh, gave, got us some training for some dudes from Chicago. And we've been rolling there since. We've yeah. just been activating the training and just building relationships in the community, doing outreach work. Yeah, and they'll try to attack this problem. Man. Yeah, Herb talked a little bit about his experience and was and was talking a little bit about his life story. And what we were basically talking about was yeah. was the the competency 
that you guys have as yeah. as either yeah. being you know after running on the street or yeah, being yeah. incarcerated things like that yeah. and i asked him this and i asked you the same thing how important do you think that is like relationally right when you look at someone you're like yo yeah. like I, I I don't get it like mentally yeah. like I I get it I've lived it yeah you know yeah. do you think that matters when you're yeah in, because you're uh, I went to prison when I was 16 years old hmm. to a to a man's prison yeah but I was actually 17 but all the things this process that these young dudes are going through I have already been through mm-hmm. in fact more worse at, yeah. at a more you know at a more we was, it was it was a much more faster pace yeah. ment- mentally. Sure. So therefore, by me going through this twenty some years in prison, it's not ah. that I can't teach nobody about this. Yeah. You know, I did over twenty five years in prison, so wow. that that means, and I did the same type of thing in prison: violence interrupting. Yeah. You know, it just, okay. it just yeah, I use the same type of tactics. Interesting. You know, is is you know people. Yeah. You know, you really do know these individuals. Right. Like well, every time somebody get murdered in this community, yeah. we some kind of way connected to them. We know uh-huh. them. Or their parents or something, so it affects us different. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? So what is what is um, what what is next for for you guys, right? So as we talk about kind of moving forward, you guys were founded. What did you say February? February last year. Yeah, yeah. So so you're a little over a year in, and so you know I, I like I like to ask people this question of sort of like I'll ask two questions. The first one is. It, did the first year go how you thought it would, right? So if you look back at yourselves on those first meetings and you're like, okay, by by next summer we'll be here. Are you there? Oh, Are yes, you where yes, you thought yes. You'd be? I think we're ahead of time. You're ahead of time? Yeah, because like we said, we're developing <laughs> other programs yeah. within this. Like I run a, a re-entry program yep. to help prisoners come home from jail and uh, we get them training and get them job training and get them acclimated back into society Sure. without going the other direction. Yeah. And it's good to have people like me and Herb on top of them. And That's we right. have provided the resources to help them. Yeah. You know, so we're doing that. We got a women's group going on. You know, we're trying to saturate the whole community yeah. and for so every that, aspect. That's yeah. the next question is what yeah. el- what else? So, you know, you, you've got, it seems like this started as as a, a violence interruption yep. thing. Like you said, there's a re-entry piece. Yeah. Like what other, I, I had an interesting conversation with Martez Tolbert and 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 he mentioned even some stuff, the re-entry thing, like I told Herb about mm-hmm. of that. Like he was like, who would you call if you got out of prison? I was like, I don't know. I'd probably call my dad, call my sister. Yeah. She was like, okay. My mother had passed away. And my father was absent. Who do you think I called? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know who. Yeah. And he was like, the same people that put me in there. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when we talk about that, what what other pieces of this puzzle do people not know? Right? Like, what what are the other either programs or things that you guys know about that you think about that people would be like, oh, I never even, I well, never even thought well, of like that. Like I said, we examples of mm-hmm. the change. Yeah, that would, you want, we want the guys to see. Once we receive our nonprofit status last year, they kind of legitimize. Okay who we are and what we're doing, how serious we are going about it. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it, if I can't use selling drugs, right? If yeah. I can't use it, man, you got to stop doing that. I got to put something in the place hmm. of this money you get, right? Uh, and I can't get you a job at McDonald's making $12 an hour when you stand there you're making $50 every 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. the math don't add up. That's right. huh. You know what I mean? Okay. So, Brian is in a position now with Network to Work where we have training. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like okay. CDLs or woodworking. We're sure. trying to get heavy equipment training and stuff like that. So you can develop a career uh, and transition okay. yourself out of the drug. Because sooner or later you go in penitentiary or somebody can blow your head up. Yeah. But that's just the way that game go. Right. It has always been that way. Right. So that's what we're trying to do now. See, that's what I'm talking about, right? Just stop selling drugs. Like, okay, well, I, I yeah, gotta eat. You gotta, it, fill, it like, you gotta been, fill this it gap. Been, it has been studies performed, one particular in Chicago, when, when uh, community organizations yeah. have found ways to funnel uh, money into the community sure, and, and uh, basically hire offenders. Sure. Or what they call uh, participants, offenders, or whatever they, name they want to call them. But they go at the, like, 17, 18 year olds. Yeah. But they have somebody mentoring them over top of them. Right. And even the 17 year olds was mentoring the little kids. Okay. But everybody was getting paid. Right. Right? This they had a real job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, it changes the trajectory of his mind. Yeah. Like, okay, I can do that's what he was saying. We can't go out there and tell them stop doing anything. Right. But like now we we are gathering resources and wrap around services yeah. to address the problem. That starts gun violence in the first place, there you go. which is lack of fatherhood. Right. Okay. You know, uh, the, the 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 family structure. Everything's been torn down the last thirty mm. years. So people like us, not just here in Charlottesville, we are all around the country. Yeah. Coming home from prison, getting out, connecting, building, trying to save our communities. Right. 
And so we're it, really trying to do it. And this is, you, you guys see this as a more, this is a national yeah, it's a movement national round. Movement. Is that right? It's a national, we had, man, we had a, uh, when we got trained, they had a, a, little, a little, like, what are you about, 17 year old kid? Yeah. Came home from jail. And the, and a mentor picked him up, which is the person that trained us. He yeah. was a former gang member, but now he running violence interrupting. Yeah. Long story short, the little boy changed his whole life around. He went back to the barber shop that he had robbed at gunpoint. Yeah. And engaged the people that was in there when doing the robbery, and they was going hard at him. And the father was like, "Man, I think it take a man to come in here yeah. to apologize." Long story short, he became the national director of that program. The little boy, the kid, making yeah. one hundred twenty thousand yeah. dollars a year. No kidding. As the national spokesman. Wow. So you see how you take participants, people that used to shoot guns, yeah, and you give them a career to help the community, and they never look back again. Wow. You know, and that's a, that's a beautiful thing, and that's the that addresses the problem of gun violence. Do you think this is a tough question? And this <clears> is we, this is what we got to end on because we're gonna get booted out of the studio. But do you think that sort of in the current kind of cultural climate that this can grow to that scale when we're talking about because who's gonna give young black boys a chance other than you know you these groups of people, these small groups of people that exist, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and so I guess the question is, do you think that? Do you believe that these organizations and this movement that you guys are very much a part mm -hmm. of and very committed to has enough heft to kind of overcome that stereotype? Because there will be 10 people that look at him and say, look, he can he can have a chance. I've done it. He can do it. Yeah. There'll be a thousand people that yeah. look at him and be like, no shot. Yeah, I'm we not deal, going in, anywhere yeah, we, near We deal kid. strictly with data. Yeah. We deal. Our, my philosophy is if they want to be saved, they will save themselves. Interesting. Because in, in our communities, the, 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 form, the way we think when we come home from prison, the, the first 72 to 48 to 72 hours are the most dangerous time. Right. Is that right? It's that's that, the, that's that short window. That's the most dangerous time. Yeah. Really? Because, because that's you, when you're going to pick which direction right. you're going to go. Because you come at home okay. with no resources. Like you just said. I see. Who, who are you going to call? call? Who are you going to call? Okay. <laughs> see, you okay. come at home with no resources, no job skills, yeah. and no rehabilitation. Uh, okay. So the only thing you know how to do is this, and that's where they go to. But I, we, we can't worry about that. We know... The, the, the people, if they have, we, majority of these people, if given a chance, yeah. the people that we know that we'll be around, yeah. they will take advantage of it. Do you think, really? That's right, because oh, yeah. it, it, right. It, it all, it's it just, look at us. Yeah. We we still participants. Even though we in a program, right. we still at danger yeah. from, from re, for reoffending. Huh. You know, so this is this is a sickness. This is a mental health issue that exists in our community. Right. Yeah. That we're trying to explain to the movers and shakers. Right, yep, that's, you that, understand? So that, it's like we yeah, playing right. a medium trying yeah. to get them to transfer this wealth into these communities right. so we can change our lives. Right. You know, that's what we trying to do. Right. And how do you this I lied, lied that was not this is my last question. Is that how, how do you guys um you know, I mean, walk into those rooms and spaces, right? Is it do you feel stigmatized as former offenders? Do you feel like people are open arms to you to like we see the value? You know, how do you you know, in I, I, as you get into that echelon of like talking dollars and people yeah, who yeah. can make things move, yeah. right? Do you feel like they give you a fair shot or do you feel like they're just like, oh I, I feel like all we need them to do is listen. Okay. Because the truth don't need nothing to stand on. Yeah. Okay. It, I mean, it's it's simple. You want to know why something happened? You become somebody that's going to solve a problem. Yeah. You know, we're about action. Right. And if if, if we, when we encounter people in yeah. different owners, if they're not about about action, we don't deal with yeah. them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we got some groups in Charlottesville that's about action. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I would have to think, you know, if people are really thinking, even though the black community, the black on black crime, we're killing each other. What's going to happen when the guns turn the other way? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure people think about that. Right? Yeah. That's sure. why you got all these folks buying these AKs and stuff and mm. stockpiling all these guns. Because I think they actually anticipating mm. the day when the real cause and effect of why we are the way we are. Huh. And people start to look at the people who design our education. Right. Who design our economics who put us in these housing projects, who gave us the food mm -hmm. and why. Mm. Yep. And the mental <laughs> illness that are going around now, mm. yeah. if they ever decide to look at yep. who created this, mm. it'd be a civil war, man. Mm. It's a different, yeah. a different game, yeah. I mean, that's just reality. Yeah. It's and a see, lot of white anger. supremacists, they know that. Yeah. yeah. They know yeah. what these people have done to us, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So they just getting prepared. Huh. But they can't win. Uh -huh. They're prepared, you know, because you figure we kill each other, we don't give a damn yeah. about y'all. You know, yeah. so y'all got a lot, four hundred some years of history that y'all ain't made up for yet. Yeah, 
and we know this. Yeah. But see, they ain't gonna teach you that in no school. No, no. no. They ain't gonna teach you that. You had to learn that pretty much in the street. And yeah. Brad is a good historian. Of that That's what I stuff. heard. Yeah. 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 Well, look, we gotta hop out of here. But I want to thank Herb Dickerson, Brian Page. We're gonna have y'all back. All right. We're, we're gonna get you yeah, back. We got, we got, we got, we got, we got some deep, deep right. waters oh, to yeah. plumb here. Um, but right. I want to thank y'all for coming. I want to thank our sponsor, Carter Myers Automotive. Um, big shout out to our intern, Cat, who helped us on the show. If you want to listen to other episodes, check us out, unitedwayseville.org, or find us on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your podcast. How do folks get in touch with you guys or, or sort of learn more about what Buck Squad's up to? Well, you can Google Buck Squad 911. Okay. Just Google Buck Squad. Or we have a hotline number. Oh, you know the hotline number? I can't think of my hand. It's probably online somewhere. Find it on, find well, it on the site. Well, you'll find it on the yeah. website. There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Buckswire911.org. Most, 911. most of our funding comes from private donors. Okay. So we could use some help doing that until we get some money from the city or somewhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we've been thriving just on private donors to see our work and the mission, and they've been supporting us. Yeah, always. Well, big again, big thanks to you guys. Buckswire911.org for yeah. Price, Herb, Brian. Have a good week. Thank you, man.